Many of the early radical feminist groups folded in the early 70s as feminism took hold more generally and activists turned to actions designed to bring in more ordinary women. Some of these approaches now seem self-evident to us, but remember that in 1970, they still appeared disruptive to many men and women who supported traditional patterns. Organizations like NOW, the National Organization for Women, and the Women's Education and Action Alliance promoted leaders like Gloria Steinem, Jermaine Greer, Kate Millett, and Chalamet Firestone to challenge old systems of thought. Florence Howe conceived the feminist press to publish books that recalled the lives of lost women and to promote social justice for women. Above all, she wanted to provide resources for teachers at all levels who wanted to expose their students to earth-changing women. Popular journals like Ms. Magazine and new academic journals like Signs legitimized the study of women's history and literature. These drew attention to the ways in which male power infused the daily lives and thoughts of everyone. The early changes were simple. I can still recall the first criticisms of pink and blue baby clothes. What was the point of dressing girls in pink and boys in blue? Would it damage little boys to wear pink? Psychologists pointed to subtle differences in parental behavior patterns, noting that parents reacted differently towards male and female babies. They cuddled girl babies more, and they played with boy babies more actively, tossing, throwing, and tickling them more aggressively. And what about Jack and Jill picture books, where Jack always fell first while Jill came tumbling after? the willing companion, but not the initiator of activity. Childhood education, in their view, was flawed from the beginning. Girls got dolls and boys received trucks. Even as school progressed, boys found their way into woodworking classes while girls learned sewing or cooking skills. High school and college girls wandered away from the sciences and math often discouraged by male professors who didn't think they were worth the time. They flourished in the humanities and in the new women's studies programs that began just then. And when they entered the job market, girls found role models among women in only a narrow range of jobs. Mostly these jobs didn't include the STEM fields science, technology, engineering, and math, from which women had been discouraged. Feminists objected to the use of Miss and Mrs., which defined a woman by her marital status. They wanted something closer to Mr. and settled on the more neutral Ms. It took a decade for them to convince the recalcitrant New York Times to make the change. Why assume that he, or man, could represent both sexes? Why not figure out a way to write that would avoid the use of the gendered pronoun altogether? Cultural feminists promoted the use of neutral pronouns and experimented with the unpronounceable S slash H-E for he and she. Better still, they offered to avoid the use of the gendered pronoun altogether, substituting they instead. New books and publications raised questions about what was natural about women's roles and what was socially coerced. Women began to consider whether so-called universal values might not in fact be those of men. They asked whether gendered definitions applied to freedom, self-satisfaction, upward mobility, and political participation, arguing that these words simply applied to women in different ways than they applied to men. These were hard questions, 
Did democracy really include women? Had it ever? Did individual rights apply to a woman in the same way they applied to men? What about personal responsibility? Asking these questions fostered a new gendered imagination, one that at its best posed a more democratic, more egalitarian, more inclusive, and broader worldview, a more nurturing and fairer environment. But asking these questions could also promote strife within families. Who would mow the lawn, take out the garbage, stay home from work with a sick child? Communities now divided over what kinds of books to use in classrooms, the promotion of ethnic, racialized, and gender identities became part of the political process.